All right, good. Welcome, people, officially. And as is our custom, we'll uh, begin with prayer, asking the Lord to bless us. So uh, let's pray together. Almighty God, thank you that you are steadfast, changeless in your love and mercy, your grace, all your special attributes. We acknowledge our need for you and our love for you. Uh, we ask your blessing on this time together. Use your word according to your good purposes and uh, give us hearts and minds that are uh, truly open to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Um, from last week, we ended where we will begin, that is, with God's mercy. And there's a famous quote that <clears throat> uh, I'd like to uh, allude to here. This is from the bard Shakespeare, uh, who extolled the virtue of mercy in one of his tragedies. And uh, here are some quotes from that uh, work. The quality of mercy is not strain. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesses him that gives and him that takes. It is mightiest in the mightiest. It becomes the throned monarch better than his crown. His scepter shows the force of temporal power, wherein doth sit the fear and dread of kings. But mercy is above the sceptered sway. Mercy is an attribute of God himself. And earthly power to then show blanketh God's when mercy seasons justice. Therefore, O Jew, though justice be thy plea, consider this, that in the course of justice, none of us should see salvation. It would seem as if Shakespeare understood the gospel quite well. Then another quote. Uh, this is from the well-known conservative theologian A.W. Tozer, well-known last century, uh, who wrote this about mercy. Quote, we should banish from our minds forever common but erroneous notion that justice and judgment characterize the God of Israel, while mercy and grace belong to the Lord of the church, whether in the Garden of Eden or the Garden of Gethsemane, God is merciful as well as just. And this is from Tozer's book, The Knowledge of the Holy. The God of the Old Testament is the same as the God in the New Testament. The God who is holy, the God who is merciful, the God whose son was crucified for our salvation is the same in both testaments. And is the God who is one God and three persons? Now and always, more could be said, much more. This will be enough for now. Some things don't change. We concluded last week. God doesn't change. We can count on his character, promises, love, ability, wisdom, and assistance. And you know, there's something else that doesn't change. That's human nature. People continue to be self-centered, deniers of the reality of God as God, 
unresponsive to God's love. People continue to be like that. Yet, people are nevertheless made in God's image. Still, people are capable, therefore, of greatness and goodness. As we enter this study in Romans chapter 12, keep an eye out for how these constants, both in terms of God and human nature, how these constants play out in history. So that is an assignment as we move into chapter 12. Paul begins Romans 12 with an appeal to reason. <clears throat> So please turn to Romans 12 uh, and verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. <clears throat> this is your spiritual act of worship so paul opens chapter 12. in other words put yourselves at the disposal of god in light of the reality of his merciful commitment to you or as eugene peterson paraphrases the passage, quote, so here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering, embracing that what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. All right. The NIV goes on to warn, quote, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. This is Romans 12, verse 2. Or Peterson's paraphrase again of Romans 12, 2. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Hmm. All right, and I like that. That's hard-hitting in terms of the issue. Well, is there an alternative to an unthinking going along with the crowd? Romans 12, 2 gives the hopeful answer. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The process of mind transformation began the moment a person placed his trust in Christ. When we're born again, we are enabled to see our sinful rebellion for what it is, and likewise see our need for the redemptive work of Christ on our behalf. That happens as the Holy Spirit gives us the new birth. Our minds begin to be transformed from that moment on. And this process of mind transformation continues from the new birth to that time when the believer is with the Lord Jesus. As the believer moves along in this process, he will experience God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. That's what is experienced as we allow our minds to be transformed by the Holy Spirit. The believer will continue to be changed until Christ returns or he dies and goes to be with Christ, whichever comes first. In the meantime, our marching orders remain be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
Today we will look to God to help us to live practically and continually for him and with him as we see what it means to be renewed in our minds, offering our bodies as living sacrifices, becoming more like our Savior. Uh, here, let's uh, turn to another of Paul's letters, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 18. Paul wrote this to the Corinthian people. And we, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So we become more and more like our Lord uh, as we allow the power of the Holy Spirit to, uh, the glory of God, allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives and directing us day by day. All these uh, homey kinds of things that occupy us, from sleeping to eating to walking around, attending to various kinds of work and so on. All right, so that's Second Corinthians 3.18 all having to do with this wonderful reality of having our minds, which tend to be so self-centered, as we've seen, uh, to center themselves, uh, our intellect, our will, our decision-making, our reasoning, all of this is included in the transformed mind. As we allow our minds to be transformed, to be changed by the Holy Spirit. So that what? So that we can experience uh, the wonder and the beauty of God's perfect will. All right, so this is the alternative that uh, is available to those who believe. Now, what is the motivation for mind transformation. And here uh, we see clearly that it is the mercies of God. That's our motivation. So Paul says uh, here in the uh, passage in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and on, right off the bat, Paul says, therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, or mercies, really, uh, that's the motivation, the basis for our allowing our minds to be changed. So it's in view of God's mercy. The living sacrifice is uh, the end, the thing that, God wants from us in order that we may uh, experience and enjoy uh, his love and the wonders uh, of his will, the good, pleasing, and perfect will, as Paul wrote in chapter 12, verse 2. All right, these mercies of God were dealt with already. It's not the first time in Romans that we've uh, encountered Paul's interest in and exposition about the mercies of God. Uh, chapters 6 through 8 of Romans uh, already dealt with the mercies of God. So Romans 6 through 8 promised 
freedom from sin's dominance of a person and freedom to live out God's gift of eternal life. So Romans 6, chapter 6, deals with freedom from sin's tyranny. And if you would turn to Romans chapter 6, we'll see that this is so by looking at uh, verse 22 and chapter 6. And this is what we encounter. Verse 22, chapter 6, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. And then this famous verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So uh, here we have this matter of freedom from sin's tyranny as those who are believers. This is part of the merciful gift of God when we turn to him. What about Romans 7? Or rather the next verse after the chapter. Romans 7 deals with freedom from the law's condemnation. If Romans 6 dealt with freedom from the tyranny of the law, uh, of sin, rather, uh, in chapter 7, we have freedom from the law's condemnation. So please turn uh, once again to Romans, this time to chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Union with Christ, which comes by faith in him and his saving work, uh, union with Christ is that which then uh, enables us to be free from the condemnation of the law, the judgment of the law. Nobody keeps the law. No one's perfect. Paul said uh, early on in the uh, letter to the Romans, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's not one who is perfect, he said, not one. And so there is that freedom from the fact that uh, none of us can keep the law perfectly, not even close. Uh, then uh, we move on to Romans 8, and we find there life and the power of the Holy Spirit. So Romans 8, 10, and 11. <clears throat> but if Christ is in you, if Christ is in you, there is opportunity for all of us to uh, be real about ourselves. Are we really united with Christ? Is he really the most important person in our lives? Uh, Paul encourages us, the Roman believers and us, uh, to be real. And if anyone <clears throat> uh, does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. Verse 10, but if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. He goes on to say, and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. So it's clear that there is this uh, radical change in who we are when we come to believe. Uh, we have the Holy Spirit living in us. We are entitled to call upon the Heavenly Father as Abba, Father. Uh, we no longer are condemned by our failures, great failures in 
attempting to keep the law of God, the law of love God, the law of love neighbor. Um, as we recognize uh, our failures at the same time, uh, we are taught by the Holy Spirit to recognize that Christ came to be punished in our place and that uh, we uh, therefore have no need to be afraid of condemnation. Christ has taken away uh, the judgment and the wrath of God that we had earned by our failure, by our sinful faith. So life and the power of the Holy Spirit, Romans chapter 8, verses 10 and 11. Now, if the basis for living mercifully is God's mercies, what I want to ask ourselves are the means by which these mercies are to be shown. So God's mercy is our motivation, but how then do we go ahead and demonstrate uh, these mercies of God and that we are uh, really beholden to him for that reason? Well, the means Paul states for the believer to show Godlike mercies is to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. To so offer your bodies as living sacrifices, Paul wrote to the Romans. Chapter 12, verse 1. Now, uh, we uh, suspect and are right to recognize that uh, we are on a collision course against the culture uh, which despises things material, including the human body. A bias that had been ingrained in the Greco-Roman world, the Hellenistic world, uh, since the teachings of Plato, who famously taught that the body was the prison house of the soul. You can't get much more negative than that about something, about the material world. The body was the prison house of the soul. That was the Greek Roman mentality uh, throughout that uh, Hellenistic culture. Such a posture against what is material helps explain the reaction, this is kind of an aside, and yet it demonstrates this uh, commitment to an anti-material, anti-body posture that the culture uh, had uh, imbibed in. So uh, please turn to Acts chapter 17. And verses 31 and 32. And uh, here we have Paul uh, speaking in the marketplace, Areopagus. And he's speaking to the citizens there who loved, according to uh, another verse in Acts, loved nothing more than to have their ears tickled with the latest uh, philosophy or religion. And so Paul is speaking to these people. Uh, and he says, well, we'll start in verse 30. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. On verse 32, when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. But others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. So 
the audience was mixed in terms of its appraisal of what Paul was saying about the body. When he said this one who is to be the judge of all men, uh, God has raised up, raised up his body of all things. And so there were some who sneered because the body was considered evil. So a God worth his salt wouldn't raise up uh, the body of some person, uh, the body being so evil as it was uh, thought to be. Uh, but uh, others, um, rather than sneering and belittling Paul's uh, commentary, uh, wanted to hear more. They were intrigued by this person who obviously was knowledgeable. Paul was very knowledgeable, uh, but uh, seemed to hold the body in high regard. So uh, it went. Paul speaking to the people in Athens. Mixed rave notices and not so rave notices. There was another reason why the call to offer one's body was appropriate. It was a widespread cultural indulgence in the abuse of the body in the Hellenistic world of that day. We could point out that sexual license and indulgence is a sad fact of our own culture today. Uh, but this was certainly characteristic of the world in which Paul lived. Having called for believers to offer their bodies as a living sacrifice, a life devoted to God's purposes and program, Paul goes on to delineate the practical ways by which believers will want to show their gratitude for the mercy God had lavished on them. And that's the word that Paul used in Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verses 7 and 8. Please turn to that passage. Ephesians 1 and beginning at verse 7, reading through 8. In him, that is in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, forgiveness of sin. In accordance with the riches of God's grace, that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And so God's grace, defined as his undeserved favor, uh, this God lavished on people. Uh, lavished because there was absolutely nothing in them that compelled God to have to forgive them and be reconciled to them. It was simply God's nature to want to uh, redeem people at great cost to himself, at cost of the cross, Jesus Christ. Uh, but at great cost to himself, God uh, wanted to have a reconciliation, fellowship with those who had to that point been his enemies. And so this uh, extreme expression uh, that Paul used. So um, we have uh, therefore this matter of God's uh, great mercy which uh, is the uh, Part of the motivation for people wanting to have their minds transformed. So, um, having called for believers to offer their bodies as a living sacrifice, a life devoted to God's purposes and program, Paul goes on to delineate the practical ways 
by which believers will want to show their gratitude for the mercy God has lavished on them. All right, so for starters, Paul commends humility, sober judgment as we assess ourselves. That's a good starting point, Paul says. Uh, so uh, engage in sober judgment, humility in assessing ourselves. Such humble assessment is meant to carry over into the realm of the special abilities or gifts that God has given the believer for use in the church. So Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 8 is where we find this articulated by Paul. Romans 12, verses uh, 3 through 8. Therefore, I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. And then Paul launched. Did you say that? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, that was Corinthians. And even though that is very valuable scripture romans 12 is what we want not corinthians romans 12 uh verses 3 through 8 all right for by the grace given paul says i say to every one of you do not think of yourself more highly than you ought but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Verse 4, just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. So Paul is talking here about what we would uh, often call a church, uh, the people of God, one body in Christ. Verse 6, we have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it's teaching, let him teach. Verse 8, if it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. It isn't showing mercy. If that's what the gift is, let him do it cheerfully. All right, so Paul is quite specific uh, here in terms of the various ways in which uh, the believer can demonstrate his appreciation for what God has done for him. So the gifts mentioned here in Romans are prophecy, serving, teaching, encouraging, sharing materially, leading, showing mercy. Now, there are other lists uh, that uh, are found in Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8 through 10 is uh, one of them, and 1 Corinthians 12 verses 28 to 29 is another. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11. The list in Romans, uh, interestingly enough, omits the apostolate. So in other places in Corinthians, 
Paul speaks about the gifts uh, of God uh, for the people of God as uh, including the apostolate. Some are apostles, some are prophets, uh, Paul goes on to say. So here, Romans omits the apostles. And the reason for this is that there was no apostle in Rome. Paul implies that his own position with the Romans is really like that of an apostle. So Romans 12, 3, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think more highly than you ought and so on. Uh, Paul is saying, I can speak to you and uh, direct all of you, no matter what your gift may be. Uh, I have a word for you uh, because I am, in effect, acting as an apostle uh, to you. So this is the implication. Uh, the point is that God has brought together a variety of believers who are gifted in differing ways and whose gifts are to be utilized for the benefit of all. So if you have, as he said, uh, the gift of prophecy, then use it. And by implication, these other gifts are meant to be used. All right, there's no room for boasting as it is God's grace from beginning to end that has accomplished all and will continue to accomplish all. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. No more is there a place for false modesty. There's no place for boasting. There's no place for a kind of false modesty. Um, each one is to make use of the gift given to him. So finally, Paul writes that love must be sincere. So Romans 12, verse 9, is where Paul talks about love. Even as Paul speaks of love, the love chapter in 1 Corinthians 13. So, here again, he is speaking of love in different words, but uh, deeply. Love must be sincere. All right. Um, Paul wonders, are others treating you badly? Bless them. So he says, uh, bless those who persecute you. Verse 14. Bless and do not curse. Uh, but back up into verses 9 through 13, uh, he urges discernment regarding evil, devotion to the good. Uh, Paul suggests that sincere love expresses itself in regarding others as your brothers. All right. So he says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. That's verse 10. And then honor one another above yourselves. All right. It also shows up by honoring others as better than ourselves. Uh, then, uh, as I put it, uh, Alan Baldwin's paraphrase, don't cool off on your faith, but serve the Lord steadily, continually. All right, so uh, the RSV says, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. And then the NIV goes on to say, verse 12, be joyful in hope, Patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Verse 13, share with God's people who are in need and practice hospitality. 
All right. So as I was thinking about how I would put this in my own day, uh, we are to look to God in the midst of affliction. affliction. Uh, and as we do that, it's a loving encouragement to other people when they see the way we allow God to help us in uh, various kinds of difficulties, afflictions. Uh, that's uh, a very powerful way of demonstrating love, the mercies of God, the love of God to other people. Uh, if you're sincere in your love for others, you will pray for them faithfully. Paul was continually indicating that he was praying again and again, continuously for the people in this church or that church, uh, as he indicates in his letter. I pray for you continually. And that's what he advises uh, and directs other believers to practice. If you want to definitely show a sincere love, then your life will find time, make time for praying regularly for other people. Again, sincere love will find a way to share with the needy, uh, with needy people. And uh, then love is to demonstrate itself by having an open door policy toward others. Practice hospitality, Paul has written. Right, and then in verses 14 through 19, uh, Paul wonders, are others treating you badly? Bless them. Are others rejoicing? Join them in their joy. Others mourning, be touched by their sorrows. Live harmoniously with everyone. Someone's considered inferior, give them the time of day. Sincere love precludes conceitedness. If you sincerely love others, you won't try to get even, even if someone dishes you up some evil. Let God do the punishing. He sees uh, and understands the situation perfectly, and he will punish in a way that's appropriate. Seek to embrace what is right in others' eyes. You will get the attention of any enemies if you set about meeting their needs. And so Paul says uh, that that's part of what it means to love sincerely. And so uh, he says, do not take revenge. This is verse 19, chapter 12, verse 19. Do not take revenge, my friend, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, then what? Uh, well, then give him something to drink. And doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. That doesn't seem very kind. Uh, but uh, that can be interpreted uh, since burning coals on someone's head was the way they carried fire. Uh, from one place to another. Uh, so it wasn't uh, as devastating as it might sound to modern ears. Uh, uh, you are to do this so that you will heap burning coals on his head. You will help him uh, to do that which is difficult to do. Namely, uh, helping a person who's an enemy uh, of of yours, uh, helping them in their need. And so uh, we have this uh, remarkable statement that Paul makes. Uh, 
And verse 21 sums it all up. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. All right, so Romans 12, 9 through 19. All of it really is about how to make sure that our love is sincere. All kinds of different ways in which we can do that. Uh, but then in, as a summary of this kind of attitude expressed in these kinds of behaviors, Paul says, don't be overcome by evil. There's evil. There's plenty of it around. There's evil. But don't be overcome by it. Overcome evil with good. It's possible. How is it possible? Well, that's part of what we've studied already. The gifts of God, the merciful gifts of God, the merciful gift of the Holy Spirit who is in us. Uh, all of this enables us to overcome evil with good. All right, so uh, let's give thanks for this passage. And then we'll uh, have plenty of time for uh, questions and comments. Your own take on what it means to uh, demonstrate sincere love. All right, let's pray. Dear God, thank you that you do spell out these things that you require of us uh, so that we can understand them. And so with your help, the help of your spirit, uh, we can practice them and demonstrate to others and to ourselves your excellent will, your good, perfect, and, and pleasing will, as you have said in your Thank you for all of that. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're now about to allow people to...